Hey guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy. Alright, I hope you guys had a good week. So this week uh, we have Carnivore Yogi who is Sarah Kleiner and I'm very excited to have her on. In this conversation we talk about so many things and it's uh, very interesting. So we talk about Carnivore, her diet, what carnivore did for her, even what physical changes that uh, meditation does for you. We also talked about PTSD and how it is to have a daughter with autism and you know how to manage from a parent's perspective, how to manage that. And I mean, we get into a lot of good stuff. I am so looking forward to you guys watching this episode and I hope you guys get a lot of good stuff from it. All right, let's get it rolling. Hey guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy, and today I am very excited to be having Carnivore Yogi with me today. Uh, for those of you that don't know her, today we are going to talk all things meditation, yoga, carnivore, um, how to deal with stress, and all that good stuff. I'm very excited to have her on today. And Sarah, hi, thank you for being on uh, and uh, you know doing this interview with me. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to talk to you. I have been following you since day one of my oh, thank you so much so when you asked I was like yes of course <laughs> yeah. thank you yeah so Sarah for those of you that don't know you why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself um, your family your carnivore journey you know what allows you to stick to carnivore and why carnivore has been different for you yeah. I know that's a lot of questions, but go ahead. <laughs> um, well, I am a yoga teacher. I live in Atlanta. I've been teaching for about eight years now, practicing for around 10 or 11. And um, I have a long history with food, food addiction, um, lifelong struggles with obesity, was overweight as a child. Uh, part of my story is that I've actually lost 100 pounds three times in my life. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, um, when I was 14, and then again when I was like 18 or 19, and then this last time was after I had my daughter um, at age 30, I want to say, or age 29, 30 is when I lost it the last time. So um, kind of how I got into yoga was that my daughter was diagnosed with autism, right, and right. I kind of emotionally went off the deep end. and. I had heard good things about yoga and how it could help you calm down. And so it was right. kind of like sink or swim. Right. <laughs> and so that's how I got into yoga, started practicing. Um, and then, you know, honestly, the way I got into carnivore is that I have struggled, you know, like I said, lifelong struggle with obesity, with my weight, with food addiction. And um, what carnivore gave me was this ability to not starve myself and not just be hungry all of the time. So right. I have over the last 10 years, since I lost this hundred pounds the third time, I was like, I am not going back. I don't want to do this again. It is very hard to lose hundred pounds. Um, I've been trying to figure out ways to just kind of maintain my weight and be healthy at the same time. So I've tried veganism, I've tried vegetarianism, I've done paleo, mm -hmm. I've done Whole30, I mean, just name it, cabbage soup diet, like we could talk all day about all the different things I've tried. Right. And when I found carnivore, I was very skeptical, but very quickly the inflammation went down and yeah. a lot of issues I was having with my gut, um, depression, just so many issues started clearing up for me. And um, it was the most stable that I had felt with my eating, um, probably ever, to be honest with you. Um, just right. off of the roller coaster of, sure. you know, binging and starving myself. And it just that, that cycle just was able to end um, with carnivore. So, uh, yeah, I think, kind of short. Yeah. Yeah. I think one thing that's really um, makes, carnivore really easy to stick to is that you don't feel those you know when everyone goes on a new diet it's like okay on Monday I'm going to start this new diet mm -hmm. and then you feel those hunger pains and you're like no I gotta I gotta stick to my diet I'm gonna yeah. drink a lot of water and uh, just not eat right or eat just veggies but I think on carnivore the reason why it works after you know that whole like keto flu or the carnivore flu yeah, or you shit. know all yeah. right um, after that it's you don't feel that hunger you never have those Top stomach grumbles and I think that's one of the reasons why it's really easy to stick to this because 
I mean, you have really good digestion and I yeah. mean, you don't feel hunger and you have a lot of energy. Yeah. So it sounds like that's what it's been for you. Um, how long have you been carnivore? It'll be, it's nine months as of like last week. So I started, oh, okay. yeah, I just started this year basically. And it's been the whole year. Um, so just nine months. <laughs> and then did you lose the, I mean, nine months is a long time. So you should yeah. definitely give yourself credit for that. I mean, it's hard for anyone to stick to a diet for even a month or three. Oh, months. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so did you lose a hundred pounds during the carnivore or was it like a little bit prior to that? Like, did I you do the keto carnivore route? The last time that I lost a hundred pounds was after my daughter was born. Oh yeah, that's right. That's right. And essentially I got on the scale after having her at the doctor's office and was like, oh my gosh, this is not real. <laughs> and sure. drove directly to Weight Watchers with her oh. and the main character in the carrier and so i just did calorie restriction and it was hard and i worked out really hard i had a friend so i think having someone to do it with you that's why i think our community on instagram is so powerful right um, and youtube and all of that i had a friend that would go to meetings with me every single week we'd weigh in and so we kind of did the whole weight watchers thing together right so i was able to lose the weight sure sure but then keeping it off. Is yeah, it's not sustainable because over time your body's going to be hungry for nutrients. Yeah. Like I even tried the, I think it was Nutrisystem where it's like you okay, microwave yeah. little, oh gosh, that food is horrendous. Yeah. But, oh yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I know that as part of your story, you struggled with PCOS. Um, yeah. When did you start noticing any healing effects of uh I guess, carnivore with PCOS or any of your symptoms reducing? Yeah. So I had um, a doctor's appointment. It was like November of last year. Okay. And we did an ultrasound and she found cysts on my ovaries. We had gotten blood work done and she was like, yep, you've got PCOS. Mm -hmm. I also had a bunch of other stuff. I had low mm -hmm. cortisol. I had just I was just kind of a mess, like very suboptimal labs. And my, my gynecologist was like, well, let's just, you know, we could just put you on birth control pills and even all this out. And I was like, no, because I had been on birth control pills and they make me horrendously sick. And I just mm -hmm. was like, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, and so I was, I actually had a functional medicine doctor friend of mine who had been on carnivore oh, okay. um, for like five months. And so she was like, just try it out. I think it could really help you with a lot of the stuff you're experiencing. Cause I also had severe bloating and gas and like, just cause I would eat tons of vegetables. Cause I thought that that yeah. was like the healing diet, you know, I was into like the walls protocol and eating, right. you know, your rainbow of vegetables and just a little bit of meat. And so when this, you know, functional medicine doctor friend of mine, she had actually been through and Terry walls is someone who kind of overcame MS using diet. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, my friend, Dr. Rimka, she had actually been through the WALS protocol, like flew okay. out, got certified to help MS patients through the WALS protocol. And so the fact that she was telling me to try carnivore and that she had been carnivore and she had that knowledge and information kind of validated. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to try it. What do, I ha what do I have to lose? And really within probably 10 days to a couple mm -hmm. weeks, it was like, a bunch of weight just kind of fell off. Uh -huh. um, my stomach was flat and I had not had a flat stomach in years, you know, uh -huh. unless I would skip eating. <laughs> right, right. No, I know. I know. Uh -huh. Or get sick. That was yes. the only time my stomach was ever uh -huh. flat. And then really like my, um, my cycles and everything started to, I stopped having horrible cramping and all that stuff. Um, and then really, I don't know how long it took for those cysts to go away, but the last time I got an ultrasound was like May, I want to say, and all mm -hmm. this was gone. Um, well, well yeah. so in six months time, I mean, it probably, you don't know exactly when it okay. went away, but in six months time, it was gone. Right. That is amazing. Yeah. yeah. And all the other symptoms I was having just kind of went away and I was like, wow, this is amazing. Um, yeah. Wow, that's uh, that's pretty powerful. Um, when do you think that maybe the PCOS started happening? Do, um... I think it had been happening for a long time. I, you know, um, as a special needs mom, I have a very high stress level and it, all that kind of builds, I think, stress. And then you eat to kind of deal with the stress. 
uh, and I was just kind of cycling through, like I'd be really good, and then I'd eat a bunch of, of almonds and chocolate at night, you know, and I think all of that kind of compounded with lack of sleep, and then I was also over-exercising at the time as well to try to manage my weight. I think it all just, you know. Confounded together, yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what does a day of eating look like for you then? Do you count calories? Do you count macros? Are you trying to be in ketosis? I mean, how does that all look for you? You know, it's like my journey with carnivore, people that follow me on my account have seen me kind of be all over the map. I think they're probably like, what's up with this girl? <laughs> I'm just, I'm never satisfied. I'm like, let me tweak this and let me change that. Yeah, that's good. You have to find what works for your bio individual body. And that's why I'm always like, I don't think calorie counting is necessarily right, right? Like yeah. one day of lack of movement will probably require less calories yeah. than a day of, ex or, you know, a lot of movement. So yeah, anyways, go uh, continue. Sorry. Yeah, every day is a little kind of different, again, depending on activity level. Um, so I, I do like to eat breakfast. I found that I have, you know, with my adrenals, my stress level, all of that, it I just feel better and have more sustained mm -hmm. energy if I have something to eat in the morning before my coffee, okay. um, eggs, maybe a little like red meat. I'm a big mm -hmm. like red meat eater. Um, I don't really like chicken because it just doesn't do anything for me except yeah. me more hungry. <laughs> um, and then I'll eat a second meal, usually um, two, three o'clock in the afternoon. And if I'm really hungry, I'll eat again, you know, five or mm -hmm. six o'clock. It just, it, like I said, it kind of depends on the activity level. Um, the amount of meat that I eat has kind of changed and transformed. I stick probably closer to a pound, um, mm -hmm. but I also do eggs. I do salmon roe. I do organ meats um, sure. Sure. with that, you know, over the pound of meat. So like a pound of red meat kind of, I like to separate it out during the day. I find if I try to do OMAD or just one meal, mm -hmm. I get very exhausted, very tired, um, and I don't have that same sustained energy level. So breaking it up, like, you know, six ounces here, six ounces in the morning, or eight ounces, eight ounces, like that works better for me, just energy levels and digestion. Um, sure. Yeah. And I've had the same experience. Um, I used to do OMAD probably for eight months, and uh, my energy was dipping, and so I've broken up my meal, and it's worked a lot better for me. And I think actually – Probably for digestion, it works better, right? So yeah. we just ease our stomach and does, we don't bombard it with so much um, food. But I mean, some people it works for them. And I think, yeah. you know, everyone should do what works best for them. So yeah. you mentioned gut, gut, um, it helped with your digestion. Yeah. Have you had any gut healing with carnivore? And then do you take any supplements? Yeah, um, I know that I've had gut healing with carnivore. I mean, I've mentioned this before on other like podcasts or interviews I've done, but I would have nights where I would literally have to sleep on the couch because oh. I would <laughs> I would have horrible gas. Oh. And I would, it would wake up my husband. And I mean, it was just horrendous, like not very ladylike or like yogic to, to admit that this would happen mm -hmm. to me, but especially if I'd overdo it on the nuts. Oh, um, really? Okay. That would cause me very horrible GI distress, as well as if I would overload kale or collard greens. Brussels sprouts were a huge offender. Oh, yes. Yeah. You know, we're told all this food is like super healthy. Yeah. And so I was always so confused as to why it was just like literally hurting my body. Um, and I, I kind of would connect, okay, well, I did eat a bunch of Brussels sprouts and now I'm mm -hmm. on the couch. Um, so really right away, that bloating and the horrible gas that would just last for hours and hours and hours with carnivore it was just gone. Um, and I have not experienced that at all on carnivore, like zero. And it's, I just thought that was normal. I thought it was normal to have bloating and, and really horrible gas and just to feel kind of, you know, slow. Um, no, with carnivore, I don't have that at all. So I've definitely had, um, gut healing with carnivore. Yeah. That's good. Um, it's amazing how when we eat a lot of vegetables and then we feel bloat and gas, we just are sort of, it's ingrained in us to think that's normal, a normal part of digestion and that it, we never think the culprit is 
vegetables. And so we'll try to go through everything we ate, but we never think, oh, it has to be the vegetables. Right. We just think right. it can't be that. And and even if we do feel bloat, let's say eating cauliflowers or broccoli, which is a common one that people feel bloat, yeah. it's, it's fine. But yeah. it's such a nutrient dense, powerful food. So it's pretty interesting. And you don't know good digestion and comfort in your stomach until you do carnivore and you have like zero gas, right? So yeah, and you know, I had been to a doctor. I went to a GI specialist because my husband was like really worried about me. He's like, I think oh, okay. you have like a stomach cancer or so. I mean, he oh. he's extreme. <laughs> he kind no, of worse yeah. sometimes, but he's like, something is really wrong with you. Like, so I went to GI doctor and got tests done and he was like, you just need to have more fiber. Like that's seriously what he told me. Okay. And you need an antidepressant because this is your stress is this is what's doing to you. You need, and I had, I've been on and off antidepressants was there's a whole other conversation, but that's what he said. Go on an antidepressant and have more fiber was his solution to oh, wow. all my stomach problems, um, which could not have been further from the truth. Right, right. No. Yeah. I mean, I've tried antidepressants for a while and uh, my family in Los Angeles that hadn't seen me when I started it. So I didn't know that my personality changed at all. But when I went there, they're like, what's wrong? You're awfully quiet. And so it's obvious it alters your personality. Um, but yeah, again, that's a different topic, but yeah. um, in terms of supplements, so how, do you use any supplementation at, with your carnivore diet? I use a few things. Now, when I first started carnivore, it was like a handful of stuff that I was on okay. for my adrenals, for sleep, you know, just a whole bunch of stuff. I think I was spending like $500 a month on supplements wow. and I was feeling like that much better. Like that, that's really what it was. Um, taurine, I mean, tyrosine, I was trying to do everything right. Ashwagandha right. Um, for energy, mood, all yeah. of that. And now the only thing I really take is um, a little bit of magnesium at night. My okay. magnesium glycinate, I take that to fall. Oh, that's good. And I okay. was doing ancestral supplements, liver and kidney. Sure. Um, but now I'm doing a raw frozen liver pill. Oh, yeah, I saw that. I'm How has that been working out for you? Awesome. Oh, like, okay. I'm so the reason I started it is because I was doing the ancestral supplements. I started those in July, just the liver, mm -hmm. and I I was like, wow, I have a lot more energy. Like, this is really interesting. I feel a lot mm -hmm. better. And so I was like, you know what? We got we went to the beach last week, and I was like, I, let me just try. I'm just tired from traveling with a kiddo and all that. And so I'm like, mm -hmm. let me just try to see what 21 days of like raw liver, three ounces a day, what that will do. And I'm on day five right now, and I mm -hmm. feel like almost a different person. Like I feel wow. so much more energy. I mean, it's yeah. kind of remarkable. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's this thing they call the anti-fatigue factor when you consume. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's that uh, there's something about liver that just gives you this energy where you don't even have to consume that much. Yeah. How is it? I, I don't I haven't eaten raw liver yet. I, I just um, I guess I'm like a little scared. So how is it? Um, do you freeze it or do you actually just eat it? I freeze it and oh, okay. I portion it out into like sure. little three ounce portions. I chop it up like pills and I just literally will grab like a bottle of water and just take it down like pills. Oh, and so I you don't it. you don't chew it. Mm -mm. Oh, I just okay. Okay. It. Yeah. Like a pill. I, should really, I should do that. I should try it because I've done it like little bits, but I don't think it was enough. Yeah, but I should just try it. three ounces. Yeah, wow, that's yeah. awesome. That's good to hear. An ounce and a half before my first meal, and an ounce and a half before. My oh, first okay, meal. okay, that yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. So you do feel a significant difference, though. And I'm less hungry too. Like that. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. That's a common thing too. Of like, wow, I I I I like to eat. I'm a <laughs> like I love yeah. food but I literally don't have to eat as much. Like I'm finding that I'm leaving a little bit of steak and I'm leaving a little bit of food and that never happens. But yeah, I just that's interesting. That really full feeling. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm done. Um, so yeah, that's, that's all I'm really doing for supplements. I do drink bone broth. Um, that's good. Mm -hmm. And I say I eat salmon roe. So okay. I eat salmon roe probably like one tablespoon at least six days a week. Oh, um, wow. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm, I mean, that's it though. It's, it's crazy. I don't really do, I tried berberine. I did, I'm about to do a, a video on my YouTube channel about supplements. Mm -hmm. I've already recorded it. I just got to put it together, but sure. I 
really bad experience with berberine. Okay. Um, it made me, and I didn't connect it. I thought it was just maybe PMS or some other kind of symptom, but it made me really nauseous. Oh, and okay. It made, um, it made me sick to my stomach. Oh, wow. And yeah. I, I thought, oh, this is just like PMS or something, but no, it was the berberine. It almost, yeah. And then I posted about it and I had all these other people writing me in my DMs and they're like, oh yeah, I had the same experience with berberine. Um, so... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I always say listen to your body. And I think if you consume a lot of liver and then salmon roe, you're basically covering all your nutrients that yeah. and you really don't need, um, I, I think, anything else. So that's good. Um, especially if your digestive system has healed, yeah. then you are probably absorbing a lot more of your nutrients. So um, I know you touched upon adrenal fatigue, but how has moving eating in the morning, how has that changed your, like, do you feel like your adrenals are being a lot um, better functioning? Yeah, I definitely do. Oh, I, you do. Okay. I definitely do. I don't feel um, like quite a huge boost in cortisol because when I would fast, you know, until noon or one or two, I would kind of run off of adrenaline cortisol for that morning. And then I'd have like a sharp kind of dip in the afternoon Usually right when my daughter would get home from school and I'd be like, oh, crap, now I'm, yeah. I'm going to have to chase her for <laughs> three hours and I'm so tired. Um, and now since I eat in the morning, it took a little bit, took like a, a couple months for me to really feel the full effects. But now I don't get that sharp dip in the afternoon. Oh, okay. That's good. It's like total exhaustion, can't move, you know, here, take your iPad and go entertain your, like, no, I can sure, sure. stuff with her. Yeah. So one of the, so Dr. Fung, uh, Jason Fung says, um, the ideal is to just eat breakfast, lunch, and then fast for dinner. Yeah. Um, one of the concerns for me uh, with eating, like as soon as I wake up was because in all honesty, um, when I used to eat as soon as I woke up, it, like and I, I think it was the glucose insulin roller coaster, but then I would feel hungry the rest of the day yeah. and then I'd overeat. And so I think there's a little bit of fear in me that hey, if I eat in the morning, I'm gonna eat all throughout the day, right? Because my weight eating starts so early. And then yeah. I usually try to have dinner with the kids. So, but has that been a issue for you at all? Um, you know, honestly, not really. Okay. I think that that second meal usually is is keeps me good. And if I'm hungry, I'll eat. And I just, okay. my whole thing is like, I don't want to stress myself out. And I've had to work really hard on this because I tend to be a very regimented person of mm -hmm. like, I have to fast a certain amount of hours and I have to like set my watch and it has to be this way. So part of my healing journey, I guess, has been just trying to let go of that a little bit and be like, if I'm hungry, I'm just going to eat. And I haven't found myself overeating. Um, that's the beauty it's awesome. of the part, I think, is that I don't find myself gorging on food when I'm just not hungry, you know? Um, so then do you still do intermittent fasting? Yeah, I do okay. a little bit. Um, okay. You know, I have, and I know one of our questions talk about is fasting. So I've done, that's, fasting has been one thing I've really, really tinkered with. I've done 48, 72, so I did a six and a half day water fast in July. I remember that. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm kind of on a break from it right now because I think I got to a point where it was just kind of maybe causing more harm than good. Okay. Um, and I was starting to feel more tired and then I would mentally stress out over it. So I kind of just naturally intermittent fast. Okay. But I've stopped like forcing myself Actively, yes. yeah, to be like, you're having a four hour window today or, yeah. you know, like I'm trying to like, let go of that a little, you know, let go of the control a little bit, which is no, that's good. I think that's really good because one thing that I'm noticing uh, and I get a lot of direct messages and some of my clients talk about this, but when people are on these really strict regimented fasts, so they'll eat only every 36 hours or every five days or three days and people that I know that start intermittent fasting, then they move to extended and then you move to these really prolonged fasting. Mm -hmm. So I know some people that fast for five days and they only eat on the weekends. But one thing that's happening is um, the last meal or the last day they're eating that refeeding period, it almost becomes a binge because mentally yeah. they're like, I can't eat for X amount of time. So I better stuff myself. Yeah. Right. So there's that little bit of anxiety. There's emotional. So 
I think when it gets to that point, you either have to structure meals or maybe you have to wean off of it yeah. um, wean, because I think there should be like a good, um, healthy relationship with food, right? So yeah. um, I think it's very healthy of you to, if you know that it's stressing your body, then if you need to take a rest from it, that's good. Like it's yeah. really good to hear that um, you are listening to your body and then working accordingly instead of this, no, this, I, you know, autophagy is so important, like, right? You know, and all these things. So we can go down the rabbit hole and listen yeah. to and Fong and listen to all the benefits mm -hmm. of fasting, and it's great. But I think that it's counterproductive if it's stressing your body out, you know. And it's just for me, I just what I, I was trying to do alternate day fasting. That was kind of where, and like you said, I was finding on the days that I was doing alternate day fasting, on the days that I would eat, I was going on like a little mini, it wasn't like a crazy binge like I used yes. to, yeah. but I, one day I ate like two bags of pork rinds and yes. I was like, that feels crappy. Like yes. that does not feel good. And I don't want to do that. And I know what's causing me to do that is that, oh, I know I'm not going to eat again until Thursday. Yes. So I was like, that's it. I'm done. Like, I'm not doing this. And right. maybe mm -hmm. I'll pick it up down the road again. It's fine. But for now, I just feel more healthy just trying to just let my body do what it needs to do, be more natural about it instead of timing it, you know? Yeah, and that's good. Um, they also say that keto and carnivore, it sort of mimics autophagy anyway. So I think uh, you're getting many of the benefits anyway without doing extended fasting. And I don't know if they recommend. So I know that um, Jason Fung and the IDM team, they recommend like maybe three day fasting at most, but they don't recommend these continuous extended fast unless you're very obese. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think it's part of it's like uh, edu re educating maybe the community as to why you're fasting. But yeah. I, I think a lot of carnivore and keto um, mimics fasting, but mm -hmm. it's not like the IDM team is married to keto or carnivore. So a lot of the fasters will eat glucose again, and then they'll go through that roller coaster okay. and then they have to fast. And so it's a little different, I think. So yeah, I yeah. think as long as your body feels better, you're not having the cortisol dips, then you're doing exactly what your body needs. And that's great. You know, you don't yeah. have to follow these regimens because nothing works perfectly for anyone. It's like, you have to find what works for you. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so let's transition to a little bit, talking a little bit about family. You know, you mentioned that your daughter has autism. Yeah. Um, how has carnivore been for you and your family? Uh, what do you feed your daughter? And then if you could talk, uh, touch upon, you know, your experience with your daughter having autism, like how it all happened and. Yeah, sure. Um, so carnivore with my family, I didn't even tell my husband I was carnivore <laughs> until April <laughs> and we were on vacation together. Um, he works a lot. He's in sales. He travels a lot. So, oh, I can, okay, okay. you know, but he's seen me, like I said, vegan, vegetarian, <laughs> paleo, whole 30. Oh, now you're doing cabbage soup. Oh, now you're just eating, you know? Like, so I was like, if I tell him I'm doing this, he's going to lose his mind. Yeah. And so I didn't even tell him for the first like three months, like wow. almost four months. And we were on vacation together and I was like, I brought the air fryer and was like making steak and he's oh, like, so oh, funny. you're eating. And I'm like, yeah. And I kind of got him listening to some podcasts. So he still eats carbs. Um, and he, he's a pretty healthy guy though. He's never had a weight problem. Okay. And, um, but he eats a lot of steak now. So dinner, a lot of times for him, I'll make like a steak and he likes avocado. I got him off the sweet potatoes finally, because I'm trying to get him to listen to me about oxalates. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so that's for him. I usually just cook him whatever kind of steak I'm having and maybe some avocado. Um, my daughter is a little more difficult. She, for breakfast, um, she will do berries and I'll try to get her the nitrate free um, sugar-free bacon. I'll make that. Mm -hmm. I do the beef bacon for her. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna sneak it in there. Lunch. A lot of times I'll do like a grass-fed beef with um, Rayo's tomato sauce is pretty low oh, sugar. Yeah. So I'll use that for her. Um, she loves seaweed. So that's good. That's good. That's good. Iodine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Instead of chips, she eats seaweed. Um, and then for dinner, a lot of times I will make her kind of whatever we're making. I'll chop up some steak and let her have some avocado. So she eats kind of similar to my husband. Okay. Okay. Um, 
she still loves her kombucha. I'm trying to get her to wean off that a little bit, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, I kind of have to bribe her. Like I made her eat lamb the other night and I was like, you can have these four dates cause she loves dates, pitted dates. I was like, you'll have four dates if you eat all the lamb on your plate. <laughs> <laughs> I do that too sometimes. I mean, my older son isn't a big fan of liver. I, th you know, it's funny because he was fine with it, but then my husband said in front of him, "Oh, you're eating liver." And then after that, I think it's a mental block, and so yeah. he's like, he embraces himself eating it. Whereas yeah. my younger son, like, is like licking every last bit of it. But oh, um, oh. so then I'll have to bribe my older son, like okay, if you eat all this liver, then I'll give you this, or I'll give you yeah. like one M&M or I'll, you know, something. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. I think it's worth it for him to eat the liver. Yeah, so. yeah. that's how I feel. I'm I mean, like, I I just, I've got to get those nutrients to her brain. Like she's autistic and she already has so many issues with processing and sensory issues. And so like, it's not, and I, I tell her, you know, I'm like, kiddo, it's not an option for you to skip meat. You got to eat the meat on your plate. Sorry. You know? Um, so she will, but I just, I do like bribe a little bit. She'll also, you know, I think microbiome diversity is important as well. So I will let her and my husband likes it too. Um, do like raw broccoli. They love raw broccoli with, um, like a homemade, like kind of paleo style ranch dressing that I'll make. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, they do that a lot, but they're, you know, pretty simple. I don't, I don't do anything super elaborate for them. Would they eat um, like cooked or sauteed or steamed broccoli? Yeah. Oh yeah, okay. definitely. They just, my daughter likes crunchy, crunchy stuff. Oh, uh, it's the texture. Her, so she really likes to crunch on things. So if I cook it, she's like, mm. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know. Yeah, just because if you um, boil it or steam it, the a little bit of the anti because so broccoli isn't a um, in, in terms of oxalates is very low, so it's yeah. fine. But um, to remove any other anti nutrients, it's better to boil. And but I mean, obviously, it's and I think it makes it a little bit more bioavailable for our bodies. Yeah. But if that's the way they'll eat it, then there's no problem. I mean, we have to. It's balance, right? It's like nothing yeah. can be perfect. Yeah, you kind of have to pick your battles. And yeah. like, if, she, if this is the only way she'll eat it, that's fine. You know, I'd rather eat, her eat this than grab chips or, you know, whatever kind of junk food that she, <laughs> that she wants. So we just, right. we just don't keep a lot of stuff in the house. Like, it's weird if you open up our refrigerator. Like, but it's just not, there's not a lot in there. There's, like, meat and eggs and berries and right salmon, you know like there's just not much <laughs> yeah no I totally understand our freezer is fuller than our refrigerator same <laughs> yes so have you noticed any changes in your daughter from just diet alone well when she was first diagnosed I was I was on Google and this was 2009 okay. um, when she went through diagnosis and so I was immediately on Google like what can I do you know, because you feel so hopeless of like your kid, here they are struggling and she had language, she had mm -hmm. eye contact, she had everything and had a severe regression um, following a flu vaccine, which I know this is very super controversial, but um, yeah. we had to take her to the emergency room the night of her flu vaccine and the doctor, she was sick, she had a fever, she was throwing up and the doctors were like, well, She's just had a bad reaction to the shot. She'll be fine, but she never talked again after that. And oh my gosh, all of her skills. So like the lights went out for her and I, it was super out of body. Um, so I went straight into like, what can I do? Cause everyone's like, well, you can do therapy. You can do this and it's just going to be difficult. So I went right into researching diet. So immediately when she was diagnosed i took her off of dairy i took her off of like you know the casein gluten mm -hmm. wheat i put her on specific carbohydrate diet for a little while so i've kind of been tinkering with nutrition for her since day one um you know we've gone back and forth but with her i notice now that she's older you know you kind of get slack and you're like oh you can you can try, you can try that. And then no, you pay for it every single time. Like if she has a popsicle, that's got mm -hmm. like food dye in it. Like she, oh. she will go into hysterics. She'll cry. Like she can't emotionally cope. I mean, it's 
it's very serious with her to not get foods that she is sensitive to, you know, the, the casein she'll act drunk. Like it's, it's, yeah, you can see with her like a very serious reaction when she has even sugars. Like she, I've had to tell my family they can't give her sugar because she, you would stop giving her the sugar and she would actually get violent. Like I had to, drag her out of my father-in-law's birthday party this past February because she had gotten some bagels and she had gotten some cake and then it was gone and she was searching the house for more and she was she's you know five foot one 109 pounds she's not tiny anymore I had to drag her out of the house because she was screaming and kicking and trying to break things because she wanted more sugar and I said this is the food you guys this is the food I cannot bring her here unless it's safe, unless you don't have these foods around. And it sucks that I can't yeah. give her, you know, I can't take her there. It's not, it doesn't suck that I can't give her the food. That's, I gotta let go of that emotional thing. But like, you know, this is, this is how she reacts to it. It's very, very serious. Yeah, and it's, um, it's, there's a study that, um, with rats, right? And I don't know if you know this study, but, they, I forgot what drug they were giving. It was either heroin or I think it was, or some opioid, but Mm. basically the rats were addicted to that drug and then they introduced sugar. Water. Yes. Yes. And then they were the, all they wanted was the sugar. Yeah. Like it's, it's insane. And it's just sad because people that are more relatively healthy, they will kind of roll their eyes at, Oh gosh, like what's a little food dye or what's a little even flu vaccine, right? Um, what's a little food dye or a little bit of sugar, like let them live, you know, that type of thing. But it's like, no, I don't think you, yeah. Yeah. I was, um, so I was doing research for my book on food dyes and, uh, I knew that they were bad, but I didn't realize. Um, so the reason why we only see like red number three or there are certain numbers, you know, it's like those numbers are not arbitrary. The other numbers have been banned by the USDA because they were um, acknowledged to be carcinogenic. And then other, um, there's another red number. I forgot which number it was, but it's the lesser used one. It's the one that's used on Marciano cherries, but it's the bright, bright red one. But that one, oh, I think it's on fruit roll-ups and stuff. But that one has been acknowledged to have uh carcinogenic tendencies and but and so the usd or the fda tried to get it banned but it just never went through so they removed it from like skin products and hair products but they never got it to your food wow and they said their statement said you better get used to your cherries looking brown wow yeah it's 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 crazy but yeah i think uh it's so it's i mean it's one good thing is that, I mean, you could see how much food is so important and so that you guys can clean your diet and then, yeah. you know, for your loved ones and, you know, yeah. for any future, you know, family. But yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty powerful. Um, have you, um, so you've significantly seen that. So that's the way that you've been feeding your kids. Um, yeah. Any other changes that you've done to sort of help manage autism for your child? Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) it's been like a long 11 years, almost 12 years now. And we've tried everything. We, when she was really little, we flew out to LA and saw Mm -hmm. different doctors, you know, and it kind of reminds me of food, you know, it kind of reminds me of protocols different people have. We would buy into stuff and say, oh, this is going to work for her. This is going to cure her and fix her. And we'd spend Mm -hmm. all this money and some kids would work for and then some kids would be like super detrimental for or would do nothing so we have tried multiple things you know for her and honestly the only thing that has worked is going more towards um i guess educational and and Mm -hmm. therapy and helping her regulate her body um we and i knew she was in there i've known she was in there for her whole life like and people would be like let's give her and I had a fight with the school system let's give her of the label of mentally retarded like they actually want to put that on her paperwork and I said no because she's not I know that or intellectually disabled and I said no she's not intellectually disabled she's brilliant but you guys just can't see it um, so what we have found is it's called spelling to communicate okay. um, some people call it RPM or letterboarding and oh, okay. actually um, 
she, we hold up a stencil board with the full alphabet and she goes letter by letter and can spell. And it's been a long process to get where she is now, but she can spell anything. Like she blows us away um, with what she's got, you know, in there. And so now that we've found this therapy, we kind of use it um, in her school, we use it at home, like we're trying to bring it in and she's starting to type letter by letter on a keyboard now. So oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. eventually I think she's going to be able to type. She says she wants to write a book and like, she's got, she's got big plans, this girl, but, um, that's good. That's yeah, good. honestly, like diet is number one, but also kind of finding that she can spell and everything is in there and trying to help bring that out of her has been the most impactful sure. for her life you know, and for ours as well. Yeah, it's beneficial. I mean, she's lucky to have you guys as parents that are trying to find what works instead of whatever the doctor prescribes or recommends is what you need to do and you just follow suit. But, you know, challenging what status quo may be and actually trying to find what's better for your daughter. And it's allowing her to thrive in her situation, right? It's giving her the ability to have grit, to want want to write a book. That's amazing, right? So yeah. it's beautiful. It's a great story. And um, I commend you for all that you do with your daughter because that is no easy. I mean, I have two boys and they're healthy, but I mean, some days it's tough. Yeah. So <laughs> I can't imagine, you know, yeah. the tantrums that they you oh, yeah. experience and just, I mean, all of that you've gone through. It's, uh, it's very commendable. Well, thank um, you. But let's transition to talking about yoga and mental health and how you found that through with your daughter and just having yourself, you know, be able to handle stress and, um, yeah. you know, your experience with your daughter. And if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah. You know, when she was first diagnosed, I kind of emotionally went off the deep end um, because I just I was in shock. I couldn't deal with it. I couldn't believe that, you know, I had this perfect child and then all of a sudden it was a completely different world and everything that I thought was not, you know. And I was like, I've heard people can do great things with yoga and heal. I had had to quit my job to stay home with her full time um, because she was just a lot and we couldn't really trust her with anyone. Um, mm -hmm. And so I started taking yoga and right away I just was like, wow, I, and it would just happen in a class, you know? So I think when you start any kind of a practice, you'll have these little glimmers of like, oh man, I feel really calm. I, I'm okay. You know, I'm in my body right now and that's okay. You know, because when you have PTSD or when you have stress or depression, anxiety, being in your body feels horrible. Like you don't want to be there. Sure. So I think a lot of people turn to food, a lot of people turn to alcohol, drugs, because just being in the present moment is like out of the question. It's like so difficult. You have no coping skills and no mechanism to be there. Um, <clears throat> so that's what yoga did for me is that it kind of helped me <clears throat> be present, you know, and little by little that the time that I would feel okay in my body would increase, you know, and it, it would start showing up outside of class, outside of that hour that I was practicing. Um, and I felt like, wow, this is just a huge gift. And so after I had been taking classes for a few years, my husband's like, why don't you just go get certified to teach because you're going to be home with her and, you know, she's about to start school. So this is something you could just do as a hobby, you know? <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I went through teacher training and I've been teaching since um, like 2012. Okay. So I've been teaching for a number of years now, and it's kind of just transformed and shifted. And um, it's, you know, it saves my life, I think, on a daily basis because I get to kind of be there for my students. And it's just kind of this daily reminder that no matter what happens, no matter what's going on, don't numb out. Don't try to stop it. Like yoga helps you kind of like go through what you're going through, you know? Right. Um, so it's been really, really helpful in that regard for me. And I practice meditation also, which has been, it was like another game changer for me. I've been doing that for the last year also. Yeah. So do you teach any of your meditation practices to in your yoga class? I do. I do add those things in. I'll do, okay. um, guided meditations. I do yoga nidra. So I'll have them okay. kind of lay down and we'll do like a 20 minute guided body scan. 
Um, that is very therapeutic, especially for people who've been traumatized. Um, mm -hmm. to, tell, the, to tell someone to just go meditate and not give them kind of any instruction. If you have someone who has a lot of stress, a lot of trauma, a lot of anxiety, that's like not a good idea because they're going to sit there and get lost in their head and think. And I've been, I, you know, until I actually went and got trained mm -hmm. how to meditate with an in-person teacher, I thought, I, I just can't meditate. I'm doing it wrong. It's the worst thing in the world. Like, it's horrible. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so if I do anything with people, I'm talking the whole time. Oh, so that's awesome. I am guiding them the whole time, talking the whole time, so that they don't have time to kind of just go in there and, like, <laughs> get lost in thought, you know? Um, yeah. So I, I do teach it in that regard. But the type of meditation that I practice, I don't teach. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Because to teach this type, you have to go to India for 108 days um, to be, yeah, to go through advanced training and learn how to initiate others. So it's oh wow, pretty intense, yeah. So is this your oxygen mass meditation, your company, or how, like, if you could tell us a little bit more about that and how you use mat meditation to handle your stress and even um, some of your, you know, the parents that have PTSD. Yeah, so oxygen mass meditation is this kind of idea I came with up with. It's been a couple of years ago, and I started this online support group. It's a group on Facebook um, just for parents to come in, and essentially um, it's all guided meditations. So what I'll do is I, I have like probably 60 or 70 guided meditations that I've done, different types. And I just have them come into the Facebook group. We do the meditations. And then every day I'll do like when we're doing like a, like a, you know, I'll do like a seven day challenge or 21 day challenge. I'll come on live and kind of answer oh, questions right. or offer support and just mm -hmm. kind of just share my experience about how these practices have helped me um, just as a special needs parent, because you know, the stuff that special needs parents deal with, we don't talk about it, you know, because it's really, I mean, it's crazy. If, and I, I read some of the stuff that other parents will post, like in my group or in other groups, and I'm like, oh my God, I can't, I can't even imagine dealing with that. You know, like these kids, well, they just do stuff and you're like, they're, they're grown, they're big kids. They'll like flood your, one of my friends, like her kid keeps flooding the house. Like he's obsessed oh with my them, God. Right? They've had to replace the ceiling four times, you know, it's like, how do you deal with that? You know, they won't sleep for days on end, right, right. They have seizures. And so you have to be hyper vigilant and watch them. And it's like, it's just, it's difficult. So um, when you are experiencing PTSD and depression, anxiety, you're operating out of a different part of your brain. Essentially your amygdala is a lot larger and <laughs> So what meditation and yoga as well can do is help to actually shrink that amygdala, to shrink the back brain. And that's been shown. Um, there's studies that have shown that, that that can actually happen. So I think for special needs parents, it's even more important that we have these practices because if, our, if we're operating at a back brain amygdala, we can't make rational choices for mm -hmm. ourselves or our kids. And then you just feel tense you know crazy all the time so right and for those that are listening um the amygdala is more of the fight or flight and then the frontal cortex is more of the logic and you know yeah. thought process yeah. um yeah i heard you on one of the podcasts and you were talking about how there's that harvard study do you want to kind of talk about it i mean it's yeah. fascinating yeah i love the study you know it's harvard in 2012 they studied people and all they had them do was do a, a meditation practice for nine minutes a day for eight weeks. And they did scans of their brains. They showed that the amygdala actually shrunk over that eight week period and that the cortex thickened. And the cortex is emotion, you know, empathy, memory, all of that stuff. So they actually changed the physical structure of their brain in just eight weeks with only nine minutes a day. That's fascinating. Um, and I love to tell that to parents or just anybody who's like, I want to meditate. I want to learn how to do this stuff. I want to meditate, but I just can't find the incentive to. And I'm like, all you need is nine minutes, you know, for eight weeks. And you can actually like change the way that you live in the world, you know, because that's what our brain is. It's like, how right. are we, you know, how are we reacting? 
You know, what's interesting is uh, there are studies that show that uh, people as they get older, you know, there's kind of that known fact that um, a lot of elderly people, they might kind of say things without really filtering. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there are studies shown that the the amygdala, um, was it the, no, I think it was the prefrontal cor cortex is shrinking. Oh, yeah. And so it's more of the, so it's, you know, I think it would maybe benefit the group to do yeah. more um, yoga. That'd be interesting. Yeah. I wonder if like it would help their brains kind of support the amygdala or um, support the prefrontal cortex growing. Oh yeah, absolutely. Between eating meat and meditation, I mean, you just got it. You got the oh, yeah, for brain health. <laughs> so have you seen a lot of your clients uh, benefit from yoga and meditation, like actually yeah. visually be able to see the changes? Yeah. And it's, it's a little slower with yoga um, sure. because they're doing it, you know, just X amount of times per week. But I have some students that have been with me since day one, and mm -hmm. I've watched them just over, you know, time periods, hey, I'm sleeping better. Hey, I don't have to take sleeping medication, or I'm feeling better, or I had this, you know, what, what happens with people typically is that they will encounter a situation, and this has been my experience, that would always kind of send them into fight flight, that would send them sure. into like a very upset place. And with a regular sustainable practice, they will go into that same exact situation and go through it without going into fight flight, you know? So they're more like observing like, oh, I am going through this kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Instead of reacting, you know, a lot of people will report, you know, less road rage. <laughs> the first thing I notice with people is they tell me they sleep better. Um, oh, boy. that's interesting. Yeah, sleep usually gets better with most people. Um, I think because you just are less hyper vigilant. I think that, you know, again, you're just able to kind of access different parts of your brain that you weren't able to before. Um, so I definitely miss yeah. a lot of that. Yeah, it makes sense because I think as a society, we, you know, like you were touching upon, uh, we really try to. Um, use different coping mechanisms like and we don't even sometimes realize that we're doing that right so yeah. we try to escape with food or drugs or any type of addiction and then actually it's like it initially starts as an escape and then it becomes an addiction yeah. but i think when you do yoga you're sort of kind of being in the moment understanding yeah. yourself and then experiencing everything and yeah. it puts a different perspective on which is really powerful right so i can see how it really benefits to do like even meditation and you know, just calming your inner yeah. and talking. So I think that's, you know, it's, that's, that's awesome. I think it's, uh, you found such different avenues. Yeah. The physical, the mental, the, you know, the nutrition portion, and you're finding what works best. Yeah. Um, what in general, like as we move away from the family conversation, what advice would you offer parents that have autistic children or, you know, loved ones that are autistic, like how best to, you know, love on them and let yeah. them be there. I think you've already touched on it a little bit, but if there's yeah. anything else. You know, I think for me, the hardest thing is just letting my daughter be herself and letting go of, you know, the life I had planned for her or who I thought she should be or, or who, you know, what I think she should do or she, she should be doing. And I think with a lot of autistic children in, in general, we are like, no, they shouldn't be able to do this. They shouldn't don't let them stem, don't let them do the weird things. And yeah, we don't want them into weird behavior loops, but you know, sometimes she comes home and she wants to just go in the backyard and play with sticks to like relieve stress. And I could sit here and be like, no, that's not okay. You're an 11 year old girl. You shouldn't go play with sticks in the yard for an hour. And I'm like, let her, if that's what she really enjoys doing, just let her be herself, you know? And so I think a lot of the work that we have to do when we have a special needs child is on ourselves, honestly, and loving and accepting them as a whole person and not who we want them to be. Um, it's really powerful. And I think that when you can do that with a child, and it's hard, I mean, it's, it's really hard, um, they start being open and more available to live up to their full potential, you know? Yeah. yeah. That's that's good. That's really good. Um, as a yogi, yeah, um, sorry, like transitioning back and forth, but as a yogi, um, you know, there's a lot of people that don't believe in carnivore, right? As a yogi, yeah. 
you're like, let's be one with the world, one with the planet. Let's uh, not hurt anything. Let's not hurt animals. So how have you been able to be a yogi while being carnivore, vegetarian? And um, how do you sort of handle that, um, being a carnivore as a yogi? Yeah, you know, it's tricky. Um, when I was vegan and I, I was, my health was really not in a good place and mm -hmm. I was always injured like one shoulder would hurt for a week and then the next shoulder would hurt for a week and um i had actually was very lucky to have a yoga teacher that saw i witnessed that i'm always injured i'm always sick i was very thin my hair was falling out like it was not a good look for me mm -hmm. every now and then i'll post a, a picture on my instagram of my old vegan days um but my i was very lucky to have a teacher kind of take me aside and say you know in yoga we call it ahimsa and that's mm -hmm. what a lot of the yoga people will cite because ahimsa means non-harming or non-violence. So they will okay. cite it as don't eat animals, don't kill animals, that's ahimsa. Well, if you, there's also ahimsa for yourself, you know, and, and for me, and this is what my yoga teacher said, he had me kind of take a step back and say, if you're always sick, if you're always injured, if you always feel terrible, mm -hmm. how can you be of service to your family? How can you be of service to your students? You know, and he actually said, you know, there are ways that you can eat meat that are more um, environmentally sustainable, where you can actually sure. help the environment. You know, we have like white oak pastures, we have regenerative farming. Um, and he kind of pointed that out to me. He said, I think that you really need to eat some animal protein. Um, and so begrudgingly, I did start eating some animal protein um years ago and i immediately felt better you know i think mm -hmm. i hear this story a lot from people who are vegan it's like they start eating the, the protein and they're like oh my god i feel so much better right you know and and so i kind of had that conversation in the back of my head when i decided to switch over to like full carnivore and i do get a lot of flack from you know on instagram i think we all as our, as our this movement kind of grows we get a lot of trolling mm -hmm. <laughs> And I'm trying to figure out how to best like deal with that because a lot of the trolling that I do get is from people in the yoga community that can say some pretty awful, horrible things and accuse me of being, you know, a bad person. Um, but I think, you know, we have to, and what I would like to do is just continue to put the message out there that, you know, Hemsa, of course, you're looking at how your body is, your health is, your ability to be impactful on the planet and to others. And then how do we do this? You know, can you buy from like a white oak pastures? Can you support, support your local farms? Can mm -hmm. you spread the message of how to be less harmful to the environment? You know, like there's right. things that we can do. And so that has been kind of a journey for me of how to, how to put all of that together. And it's still definitely evolving. Yeah, it, it's really fascinating when you just, so I have a background in psychology and so I always find it fascinating when you just find like trends within societies and it's just interesting to see when you have a certain dogma, you become yeah. so tunnel vision, right? Whether it's even in the carnivore community or yeah. um, in the vegan community, it's like you're not, you become, it becomes a part of your identity and it's hard to say, I will believe anything that may be different, right, than the overall thoughts of the community. And yeah. it's uh, it's interesting. I mean, it helps us become strong civilizations, but it's also, it's kind of sad, you know, that yeah. um, people aren't, just the logic of, well, if you're all about peace and not harming, then why are you trolling and, you know, saying mean things? Like, it doesn't, like, do you see the disconnect there, right? Like, it's, yeah. it's interesting. Yeah. Well, definitely. I mean, I think, you know, I saw one thing is that you filter words. <laughs> I don't know if you saw my post, but um, yeah, I, I think that's, you know, it's a smart way. <laughs> it's yeah. a smart way yeah. to, uh, you know, be more, be still be there for your followers and not yeah. have to, you know, be, because I think it does affect you, right? It does, affects everyone to get yeah. these nasty messages or trolling. And it, I mean, we're all human. It's going yeah. to impact us, right? Even though we don't know who this person is. Yeah. But I mean, it, little by little it chips a little bit and it hurts okay. a little because we're all human we're supposed yeah. to be connected so I think you're doing it you're managing it in a really great way um to wrap up this whole yoga um bit what from the world of yoga from meditation what recommendations would you give in terms of like weight loss um and changing habits 
Yeah. And like, even when like, um, you know, when people turn to food, when they're stressed, like how all, like all of that, if you have any sort of advice to offer. Honestly, I think it all goes back to brain structure and looking at the benefits. You know, I have a lot of people say, can yoga help me lose weight? Can I burn? How many, I have clients, how many calories did we burn doing that type of yoga? Or how many calories does this burn? And I think it's, you know, getting away from worrying about how many calories you're burning and thinking about that whole rewiring of the brain. So if your amygdala is very large and you are in fight flight, that's also your impulse control too. So you're going to go for the food. You're going to go for, um, you know, the easy, quick thing. And so if you think about it, if you can get to that point where you have a, a practice that's sustainable that you're doing on a regular basis, that impulse control, you're going to have a little bit better rain on it if your amygdala is getting smaller, you know, if you're sure. thickening your cortex, you know, you're going to have better um, access to executive functioning to make right. those decisions about food. You're also going to tap into your parasympathetic nervous system, which is, you know, the vagus nerve, the part of the body that is responsible for calming us down, for lowering mm -hmm. cortisol, for lowering right. stress. So if you have and I experienced this again as a special needs parent. Elevated cortisol chronically, cortisol is going to raise your insulin. Insulin is a fat storage hormone. So how do we counteract that? We try to get into that parasympathetic state, try to get the body to relax, to calm down, to naturally lower the cortisol, naturally lower the insulin when you've done all that you can with diet. You know, there's – Right. I, I definitely – tell people that if they're like, I want to lose weight with yoga. I'm like, well, it's not like going to the gym and killing yourself. It's, right. it's kind of a different path. But um, yeah, that's, that's what I would say. And then uh, what about in terms of uh, any advice in terms of um, your experience with carnivore um, and losing weight or, you know, just anything about nutrition with carnivore, any advice from your, your eight months of experience with carnivore? Yeah, I think honestly, when you're first starting, don't play with it too much. Just get through adaptation. I think getting through that initial, like almost 60 days, you know, maybe even 90 days of just letting your body switch over to fat burn mode, get used to eating meat, get used to just living that way. Um, I'm not somebody who encourages sweeteners or cheats or any of that stuff. I think that that is very counterproductive. It's messed me up big time. Mm -hmm. um, so trying to stay away from those. And then, you know, once you get through adaptation, you could play around with like fat ratio and maybe try some fasting. And, um, but the biggest piece of advice is just like, take it easy. <laughs> let your, let yourself rest. Don't right. start CrossFit and carnivore on the same day, you know? <laughs> yeah. And CrossFit, if you do it a lot, will worsen your cortisol too. Yeah. So. I actually didn't do any working out for the first six months. Like I just did walking and yoga. I did not lift weights at all. Now I am lifting weights. I'm squatting. I'm doing all the fun stuff I love to do in the gym, but it took me a long time to kind of let my body have rest that it needed. And now I can kind of play around a little bit more with sure. it. Yeah. That's good. That's really good advice. I, I was the same. So I didn't work out initially. I wanted to, focus on one area instead of kind of spreading myself thin yeah. and then over time it was incorporating some exercise just because it's beneficial for our health not necessarily for weight loss yeah um one question i have is uh you know if when people are stressed what's a quick like meditation or you know like a breathing exercise or something that you know when mo in moments of stress like what can some somebody do like a quick like yeah. a quick so the big thing with breath is you got to think about what's going to activate sympathetic versus parasympathetic for sympathetic is really mouth breathing. So a lot of mm -hmm. us are breathing in and out of our mouth like a lot and not even realizing that we're doing it. So you're not getting really those more, you know, kind of calm, even breath. So I say right yeah. away, switch breathing in and out of your nose and then to give your nervous system like a nice, easy place, just even breath. So Inhale in four or five, exhale out, same exact count. So that's a really quick one. It's just like, okay, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, in and out of the nose. And another yes. I love it. Sorry, um, I, I think I lost you for a second. Oh. So what did you say? You breathe in and out for four and then mm -hmm. out for four, and then it, it's an easy way to get you into parasympathetic? Was yeah, that what you just 
inhaling and exhaling at like an even pace. Um, okay. Very helpful. And then even extending your exhales out just a little bit longer than your inhales also helps. So in for four, out for six, maybe in for four, out for eight. Um, so that's just quick and easy, like quick, yeah. easy breathing. Yeah. 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 I practice that. I think it helps. I even sometimes like put my head, um, like I just put yeah. my head downward yeah. and that really helps you just between my legs and then just breathe that way too. Or just, um, just try to focus on the room, any sound yeah. and just closing your eyes and just experiencing the room. Like yeah. those have been helpful to just kind of step away from the stress. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask you something and I just, I just lost it. But in the meantime, what is um, your one of your favorite quotes and why? Yeah, so probably one of my favorite quotes that I use a lot is that um, everything is happening for you and not to you. And it's okay if you don't like it. It's just easier if you do. And that's Byron Katie. And okay. I try to remember that, you know, when – I'm in a place where I feel like I'm the victim and everything's going wrong. Like, no, you're not, you know, um, it, it kind of takes me out of that victim mentality. Um, okay, right, right. To just remember okay. life is really just happening for you and that eventually your test is going to become your testimony, you know? Yes. I absolutely believe that. That's good. That's powerful. I mean, it's so easy to go, Oh, woe is me. You know, something happened, my daughter got sick and look at my life now, but instead you turned it around, made it your story and look at your healing journey. Look at your daughter. It's, it's amazing. Uh, I do remember what I was going to ask you. So if someone wanted to start meditation and do that nine minute to shrink yeah. their amygdala, where, like what resources do they have? Um, yeah. Should they download an app, a video? Like what, where would you ask someone that's either brand new, kind of new to meditation? So there are definitely a lot of good apps. Um, Insight Timer is free. Um, I actually have some recordings on Insight that I've uploaded to them. Um, there's the Calm app. There's a lot of guided apps mm -hmm. that you can do. Um, the way that I actually meditate, there is a book called uh, Bliss More by okay. a teacher. His name is Light Watkins. And I've studied in person with him. My husband studied in person with him. But the book is a very easy, simple read, and he gives a technique to where you can actually practice um, this the, with meditation by yourself without mm -hmm. an app. And the first time I did it, the first time I read the book, I was like, and did the technique, I was like, this is too easy. Like, this is not, really? oh yeah. And, and I was like, this is not real. And then it was like, I had a situation with my daughter. Um, this might freak people out, but she went through about a year of, of fecal smearing and it was nightly and it was like I'd be cleaning for three and four hours and it would happen and I would just lose my mind and scream and you're right in fight flight. So yeah. I had a book and I had been meditating out of the book using the technique for probably about five days and my husband was out of town and I was in the living room and I kind of smelled. I was like, oh God, here it comes. And I walked in that bedroom and I literally, it was like I had just transcended my body and I just cleaned and I was not even the least bit upset. And I was like, oh my God, I just meditated. And then I just had this experience and it was so powerful for me. I tell that story, people are like, oh my God, that's just gross. But like, it's my life. It's just my truth. Yeah. <laughs> and after having that experience, it was like, I'm, I'm going to get an in-person teacher and kind of take it because this is like a easy technique anyone can do. Both my sisters have been doing it out of the book since January. They love it. Um, but I wanted to go to the next level and get an in-person teacher. So that's awesome. Places you can go afterwards. Um, okay. But it's called Bliss Moore and his name is Light, L-I-G-H-T Watkins. Okay. And I'll link to all the information. I'll link to your meditation group and I'll link to cool. all this information. So it'll all be in the show notes. So yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you for all of that. Yeah. So, um, you know, thank you for being on the show. Uh, where can people find you and what are you up to next? Yeah. So I am on Instagram most of the time as at carnivore.yogi. Um, I just started a YouTube channel. So I have probably, I don't know, like eight videos up. I'm going to keep on putting more up. And the link to that is in the bio, my Instagram. Um, that's, those are the two places to find me. I do have the special needs group. I'm kind of like right now in a transition trying to figure out 
how to reach people and help more people. Um, you know, so I'm kind of exploring different options sure. and certifications where I can start reaching and helping more people. So yeah, That's stay tuned. Beautiful. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you so much. This has been very helpful and it's, uh, it's motivating like all you're doing in a, you know, just one body. And so, I mean, you've motivated <laughs> me to try the raw liver and you've also three ounces a day and I'm going to yeah. also do the, you said eight weeks, right? Is, yeah. Or what? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I want to shrink my amygdala. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, I will talk to you again soon, I'm sure. But um, yeah, thank you again for um, joining me and I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Bye. Bye. enjoyed the episode um, I definitely recommend you looking into oxygen mass meditation and all things about uh, carnivore yogi and Sarah Kleiner she has so much to offer to us and she's a wealth of information uh, I will have all of the information down in the notes um, I also recommend downloading any of my free informational guides they will also be down in the notes as well okay guys I will talk to you next week but until then take care of yourselves eat a lot of meat eat a lot of good fats and remember take care of your bodies because it is the only place you have to live all right guys have a good one and I will talk to you soon bye guys